Welcome to this evening's program. I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. And it's a pleasure, pleasure to welcome you to today's program with Helen Epstein and Ellen Bachner Greenberg. As many of you know, Helen is a leading voice among those engaged in Holocaust remembrance. And her book, Children of the Holocaust, published in 1979, was one of the first major books to examine the intergenerational transmission of trauma from Holocaust survivors to their children. Today, Helen is joining us to discuss her experiences, hopes, and perspectives on the second generation. Last year, we hosted Helen for a terrific book program about Francie's War, the recently published memoir of her mother's life. You can order both Children of the Holocaust and Francie's War at the links in the Zoom chat. This evening's program is co-presented with Descendants of Holocaust Survivors, which is a New York-based group for children of survivors to connect with each other, to share thoughts, feelings, and memories, and to learn and teach about the legacy of the Holocaust. The co-founder of Descendants of Holocaust Survivors is Ellen Bachner Greenberg, who's in conversation with Helen this evening. Helen and Ellen's discussion is sponsored in part through the Battery Park City Authority Community Partnership. All of us at the museum are very grateful to the Battery Park City Authority for their generous support and collaboration over so many years uh, and for making this evening possible as well as some upcoming programs which we'll mention as we close this evening. Please feel free to share questions in the Zoom Q&A box throughout Helen and Ellen's conversation and I'll get to as many as I can towards the end of the hour. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Helen Epstein and Glenn Bachner Greenberg. Thank you, Ari. And um, thank you, Ari, and the museum for partnering with us on uh, this evening's program. And um, I'm here, obviously, with Helen Epstein. And coincidentally, Helen, who was the first to write about uh, children of survivors, was the first uh, one to be at the museum for their first online programming once COVID happened last March. Um, and it's been a challenging year for everyone, and certainly for you, Helen. So um, I hope you're doing well. and. Uh, Let's hear about how you're well, doing. Well, uh, right, Ellen. Uh, many of you might be surprised at my uh, short hair. Uh, the reason I have short hair is because shortly after COVID began, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I had cancer during COVID. I had chemo during COVID. And the reason I bring it up is not only because Ellen uh, asked me about it, but also because uh, my parents' experience as survivors was so sustaining uh, to my time uh, in surgery, in chemo, in radiation, because uh, I had just finished working on editing my mother's book, Francie's War, which uh, takes place between 1939 and 1945 uh, in a series of camps in Europe. And as I worked on her book, of course, I internalized it in a very different way than through all the stories I used to hear. And I found that knowing that my mother had gotten through all the stuff she had gone through, I could certainly get through surgery and chemo and radiation. It's very powerful. Um, you know, it's interesting because they say that your book was the first on intergenerational transmission of trauma, but yet you're speaking here of resilience and strength. So that's, um, right. that's right. I mean, I think that one of the mistakes people make when they when they talk about children of the Holocaust without having read it is that they think it's all about trauma, but in fact, it's about something much more general. It's about the transmission of history and culture and experience from one generation to another. And that experience was um, very varied because of course it involved trauma and it involved great strengths and great cleverness. And on the, on the other hand, also on, on a broader spectrum, it involved so many different kinds of people and so many different kinds of experiences. We in the United States tend to forget that they're children of survivors and survivors on every continent on the globe. There are children of survivors in South Africa and in the Czech Republic and in Israel and in South America. And all of them have different experiences depending on the culture in which they were raised. Right, interesting. So let, let's go back to the beginning. So how did you begin your career as a journalist and how did you come to write this book? So I began my career as a journalist. I was a music uh, major at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, 
And uh, every summer we'd go home to the United States and we'd take um, a charter flight from Luxembourg, Icelandic Airlines to the United States. And the summer of 1968, I finished my exams in Jerusalem and I decided to hitchhike through Europe uh, with some friends of mine. And I got to Prague on August 16th, 1968, and the Soviet army arrived on August 21st, 1968. So I was 20 years old. I was staying at survivor friends of my father's, so you can imagine what went on in that household. And the international telephone lines were cut and they ordered me to stay in the apartment and not go out. There were tanks just outside, there were airplanes, there was shooting in the park behind the house. And so I sat inside and I listened to the radio and there was a typewriter there and I decided to write a piece about what I was hearing. And uh, when I was evacuated to Paris two days later, uh, I took what I had written. There had been carbon paper in the house. I don't know how many of you remember carbon paper, but that was to duplicate uh, what you wrote. And so I had two versions of what I wrote and I sent one to the editor of the New York Times and the other one to the editor of the Jerusalem Post. I had no addresses, of course. So I just wrote editor, New York Times, New York City and editor, Jerusalem Post, Jerusalem. And the Jerusalem Post published the article and when I finally got to Luxembourg for my charter flight, I was standing on the tarmac and I heard two people in front of me online discussing the article they had read about this girl caught in the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in an apartment. And that's how I became a journalist. And fortunately for me, when I came back to school to Hebrew University, um, I went to the post and asked, are you gonna pay me for this article? And they said, not only are we gonna pay you, we're gonna hire you as our university reporter. So that's how I became a journalist. Great. And um, so how did that all come upon that you ended up writing the first book? I, kn I know that so many of us who read it back in 1979 and, and it's been in print ever since for over 40 years. And I believe now it's the, the third edition that, that, that just came out. Is that right? The third one? I think so. Maybe fourth. I don't know. Right. And, and here, many of us remember, here's the, the, the original one, which obviously has been read and loved. Um, and back then, people said that you put into words what they didn't even know how to ex express. So it really resonated with us. Did you start off by knowing that's what you were going to write? Certainly not. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had no idea what I was going to write. In fact, I was hoping to become a music critic or something like that. But um, what happened in Jerusalem was after the Six Day War, uh, people our age, a second generation people, came from all over the world to volunteer, thinking that this, the war was going to go on for much longer. Right. All but, uh, thousands of us were, were, were caught in Israel that summer of 1967, and many of us, several thousand, decided to go to universities in Israel at that point. And so when I was living in Jerusalem, I gravitated not toward the American group because there was an American friends, there was an American program in Israel, uh, junior year abroad, but those really weren't my friends. I gravitated to people from all over the world. And I started noticing that they had something in common, which was very weird. I noticed that all of them spoke two or three languages. So I had a, a friend from Brazil who spoke Hungarian. And I, spent, I had a friend from Belgium who spoke uh, Polish and Yiddish. And uh, I also noticed that all these people didn't have families. They didn't have grandparents. They didn't have extended families. And they all talked about the effect of the war on their lives. And be, having started um, doing journalism after the Soviet invasion, mm -hmm. I noticed this. And I thought, well, all of us have kind of the same situation. It's really strange. And we all, why do I feel this affinity toward this group rather than to my American um, classmates? And I started writing about it. And at the time, it didn't occur to me that I was going to be a journalist. I thought maybe I'd become a novelist. So I started a novel called We Who Came After the War. Okay. And of course that went nowhere because um, I wasn't studying uh, writing and I, I, I hadn't <laughs> written enough really to be, to be fluent in the form. But at any rate, that was how I started. 
Now, it's interesting that you, you were born in, in, in Czechoslovakia, both of your parents were, and you grew up um, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, were you amongst other children of survivors? Because you, you connected in Israel to people of different backgrounds. Right. That is a very interesting question, because in fact, I was growing up among children of survivors, but I didn't know it. I was growing up on the Upper West Side. I went to a great high school um, from, from grade seven to 12 called Hunter College High School right. for mm -hmm. gifted girls. And many of my classmates, I would say maybe 25% of my classmates were kids of either survivors or refugees. And nobody ever talked about it. I don't know how that happened, but we didn't. Whereas in Jerusalem at, at, at university, because we were clearly coming from different countries, we would ask about each other's backgrounds and that came up immediately. So it's really funny because of course, I've kept up with my high school classmates. We have a list serve and everybody is just astonished to find out who was a child of survivors and we didn't know. Didn't know. Was it talked about amongst their families? I, I, I know that it was um, in your family, right? Tell us about what yes. it was like in your life. Yes, I, I was more aware of the fact, I was very much aware of the fact that my parents socialized almost entirely with other survivors and other refugees. Mm -hmm. So, and, and they had, they didn't have dinner parties because nobody had enough money for a whole mm -hmm. meal, but they had dessert parties on Friday and Saturday nights. And people would come over to the house and they would sit in our living room and for three or four hours, they would discuss the war. Mm -hmm. And some of the, what was unusual about my family was that there were many non-Jewish Czechs who would come over. And some of these non-Jewish Czechs had also been in concentration camps. So everybody was talking about the camps. Everybody was talking about the political situation that led to the war. All and this was all unfiltered? This was all unfiltered. Nobody paid any attention to me and my brother and later my younger brother. I have two brothers. And uh, they all spoke in Czech and in German. And so I found it very difficult to know what was what, you know, for a while I, I just blended the two languages. Okay. And um, I heard all kinds of things. I mean, just all kinds of things. I heard about this. There was a woman who was close friends with my parents, who was a Sudetenland German non-Jew who was expelled from Czechoslovakia after the war because she was a Sudetenland citizen. And so um, I heard about the expulsion after the war. I heard about people who had been in prison during the war. There were at the time I was growing up three Czech restaurants in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And one of them, Vashataz, what had been, the man had been a restaurateur in Prague and he was known to be sympathetic to the resistance and to Jews and he had helped many people escape. So I knew that too. So right. there was very little I didn't know by the time I was about 10. Wow. Now that that's a lot for for a ten year old and and ten year olds and children are very impressionable. Uh, was this scary to you? Did you discuss this with your parents? Uh, no, you that know? wasn't what was discussed at, at at those dessert parties was not scary to me because nobody seemed scared. They all hmm. were they were arguing about what could have been different. You know, they would talk about Yalta and they would talk about um, they would talk about uh, Munich about the Munich Pact. So it was more political than it was more the gory political. details of what went on in Auschwitz? Right. But what it did was it normalized my parents because it made it, made it seem as though they belonged to a group, group of people who had gone through this together and they weren't all Jews, which was also a normalizing thing. You know, I grew up thinking for a while that everybody had been in concentration camp. And that, of course, wasn't the case. But the other thing was, the scary thing was, what scared me was my mother's Auschwitz tattoo scared me. Yeah. Because my mother always answered questions. She was she did not filter her responses. And so by the time I was three or so, I knew that she had been in a prison. She had been put in a prison by what she called bad people and that all my grandparents had been murdered. And when I asked why, she said, because they were Jews. So that was scary. And the other thing that was scary, I don't know where or why this became the major sort of icon for me, but trains 
and transports were the major thing for me. Every time I got on the subway, of course, you know, here I am living in Manhattan, so you're on the subway all the time, but I used to fantasize that those were transports going to camps. I cannot remember uh, where I got this idea, but I can tell you that my parents were extremely um, uh, not thinking very clearly about what they exposed me to. So mm -hmm. I saw the pawnbroker when I was quite young. I saw the diary of Anne Frank, oddly enough, in Stowe, Vermont on a ski vacation. And I remember it being a very small cinema. And I remember at the end of the movie, when the Nazis were climbing up the stairs to the attic, I got so such a bad stomach ache that I had to rush out and go to the bathroom. So I don't think my parents were very careful about what they exposed me to. You know, back then there weren't um, parent discussion groups. There weren't, you know, sections in libraries on self-help. This, this was brand new and, you know, I guess, they hadn't had parents at some point either. They, you know, they did the best they can, but certainly the impact and, and, and the fear, I recall in, in your book, you write about being, you start off writing about being on the subway. Right. Um, and as if you were going from, from one camp to the next. Mm -hmm. um, in the decades since um, your first book, you've written two other memoirs. Um, where she came from, a daughter's search for her mother's history. That's a chronicle of your mother's family for three generations and the long half lives of love and trauma, which is decades of your own personal self discovery and healing. Um, can you tell us about uh, the journey and, and, and the difference in the books? Some of them are from different lenses and different viewpoints. Right, it's interesting that you asked this question today because this morning, I just got an email from a scholar in Italy who's uh -huh. writing about my work, which is kind oh. of astonishing to me. Um, this has never happened to me before. So um, she sees it as um, moving from a journalistic memoir, which is Children of the Holocaust, right. to uh, researching history uh -huh. and social history and family history, which is certainly where she came from. I was really interested because the Holocaust had caused such an abyss in most of our families between before the war and after the war. I, my idea back then was to build a kind of bridge over that abyss and to connect back to what Jewish life had been like for my family from about 1800 to 1948. And so um, I spent a long time researching that book and I'd be glad to answer questions about it because it really deepened my relationship with the Czech Republic. And I'm, I'm very involved with the Czech Republic today. In fact, I just participated um, last week in the reading of names of the murdered Czechs from that, that passed through Terezin that was organized right. by the Terezin Initiative. So the third book in this Holocaust trilogy is The Long Half Lives of Love and Trauma. And that book was really occasioned by my wanting to write about love and sex and how those areas had been affected um, by the Holocaust and mm -hmm. how they had affected survivors and how their parenting um, was affected by that experience. And I remember talking with a friend of mine who's a British um, second generation person, Anne Karp, you may know her book, um, The War After. And I remember saying to her, Anne, I'm going to write about love and sex and survivors. And she said, oh, I can't believe you're gonna do that. I <laughs> never dare. And I said, well, you watch. So I did. And um, I had always um, perceived my mother as being someone who had been deeply affected by the war uh, mm -hmm. in terms of her development, in terms of her maturation as a woman. I didn't perceive my father that way. My father was 16 years older than my mother. He was born mm -hmm. in 1904. He was um, really a grown man um, when he went into the camps, 
and uh, he was he he was one of the older survivors when he came out of the camps. And my mother always said that the war had shaped her much more than it had shaped my father, that my father went into the war and came out of the war pretty much the same person, whereas she did, she said she did not. She had been radically changed by the war. And I think one of the areas in which she was changed was in her attitude towards love and sex. Right, which is um, also, um, now last year, your, your, uh, let's, let's talk about your mother's book, Francie's War, which is her memoir that, that you, you put together. And there's also a lot of discussion of, of, about that. It, it, it's a survivor's testimonial with, um, you know, a lot of talking about uh, the love and the sex, um, how that related and happened in the Holocaust. So I'd love to hear right. about that. That's an interesting story because, um, because of where she came from, I received an email out of the blue from this second generation guy in Berlin. And, you know, when you're a writer, one of the great fun things about being a writer is you open your email every day, you have no idea what's going to be. <laughs> so one day I opened my email and there's this guy from Berlin writing me kind of in a berating tone saying, hmm. a friend of mine has just read where she came from in Czech and you claim that your mother was in jail with the woman that my father was married to before he was married to my mother. And, you know, that was a little bit hard to figure out, but I figured that out. And uh, he said, I've written a book about this woman. Her name is Marianne Goltz. And I don't believe she was in this prison cell with your mother. So that prompted me to go back and find my mother's manuscript which she had written in 1974. I'm sure many of your parents have written um, their wartime experiences and they're sitting in some drawer somewhere. And that's where my mother's was. My mother's was in a drawer somewhere and I, I found it. And I found the episode that he was talking about. And I said, I, you know, it's exactly as it's in my book. So if you'd like, I'll scan the pages. It comes from my mother's memoir. I did not make this up. I don't make things up. I write right. nonfiction. So um, I scanned the stuff and I, and I sent it to him. And then I sat down and I read the manuscript from start to finish. Now, what you need to know is that my mother died in 1989, very abruptly. She was quite young. She was 69 years old. And she hadn't left behind much stuff. She had this manuscript and she had, a, she had some letters and she had um, a family history that I had used to write um, uh, where she came from. But the family history was only 12 pages long. This manuscript was 200 pages long. Mm -hmm. And as I read it in 2018, uh -huh. I very much was influenced by what was going on with the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, this manuscript was rejected in 1975 because the world wasn't ready for it. They just weren't ready for a woman like my mother who talked very candidly about sex, who was not at all prejudiced about heterosexual or homosexual sex, and who really understood that there were lots of different things that happened in the camps that needed to be written about, that Primo Levi hadn't written about, that Elie Wiesel hadn't written about, and that were um, quite common in her experience. And so she wrote all this stuff, and I think people were horrified in the publishing industry. I mean, in 1974, 1975, there weren't too many women in the publishing industry, certainly not like today. And uh, Jews were not all that forthcoming about um, what had happened in the war. Uh, and, and the Holocaust was wasn't necessarily talked about. So let let alone what your mother w w was writing. That's true. So so I started reading it, and you have to understand. I mean, I'm sure you do understand <laughs> that 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 none of these stories were new to me. I knew everything she had written in the book because she had told me so over I don't know forty years or something. Mm -hmm. So I I didn't think it was such a big deal, but I did think that it would be a great resource for scholars because I was aware that over the last 40 years, women's studies had, had come into full flower, Jewish studies had come into full flower, Holocaust studies had come into full flower, and Central European studies was now a big deal. So I said, I know what I'm gonna do. People in Prague are gonna love this book. I'm gonna send it to friends of mine who are academics in Prague. Right. So I did that. 
And I said, would you be interested in publishing this as a monograph? And they all wrote back and said, yeah, we'd love to, but we think you should go to an agent and try and publish it in the mainstream. So the first publishers who bought it, the first one was a Slovak publisher. The second one was a Czech publisher. Right. And only the third one was an American publisher. And then the fourth one was a British publisher. My mother was liberated by the British army. And there's a whole section about right. uh, liberation and the aftermath. So, so yeah, so it turned into this very surprising and gratifying um, experience. And it's now in what, six, six different languages, six countries? I think it's in nine countries. Nine, up to nine. And eight languages or seven languages. You can go on the website, Francie's War, and you can see, as you were talking yeah. about earlier, the, the, the incredibly different covers. Yeah. Because, um, of course, the Holocaust has now become very fashionable reading. <laughs> so some of the covers are kind of racy and racier than I would have um, wanted, but that's the way they do it in some countries. So just like your mother, you were way ahead of your time. In, in what you thought and what you wrote. And I think I was very influenced by my, my mother. And I think what was surprising to me in um, working on her book was I realized that my writing genes came from her, that she was a very good writer. She wasn't a, she wasn't a practiced writer, right. but um, she, was, she very much liked being a dressmaker and a dress designer. She had no right. aspirations to be a writer, but she right. was a good writer. Right. Now let's talk about your, your father. What was he like, his impact, and what was the relationship between your parents, and what was life like in the Epstein household? Well, my parents were extremely different, and like many parents of the people in this community, they probably would have never married each other. They would have probably never met each other had it not right. been for the war. Um, my mother was this incredibly sophisticated, um, fashion designer, extremely elegant, who spoke four languages, was born in pa Prague, wanted to die in Prague, adored Prague, went to the opera and theater, etc. My father fell asleep at the opera and the theater. <laughs> My father was from a small town called Rodnice on the Elbe, and uh, his father was the president of the town synagogue. And the Epstein family had lived in Rodnice back to the 17th century and had had a leather factory in Rodnice. And before they had a leather factory, they had a tannery, which is one of the classic Jewish professions in, in, in 19th century and 18th century Europe. So um, my father grew up as the, as the second son of this factory owner in this small town his name was Epstein, so he was clearly a Jew. And he decided, uh, Rodin says, on the Elbe River, and he just loved swimming in the Elbe River. And by the time he was 18, he was, a, he was competing in swimming championships. And he went on to become a water player who represented Czechoslovakia in two Olympic games. Yeah. One of them was the Berlin Olympics. So, it's it was always very hard for me to understand this. I have inherited neither one of my parents' passions. I'm not interested <laughs> in competitive sports. And I'm not at all interested in fashion. So I never really got this until recently. But he was a famous athlete in Czechoslovakia. And after the war was over and he came home, he was elected to the National Czechoslovak Olympic Committee. He, right. was, he was like a big deal. And water polo was a big sport in Czechoslovakia. I'm not sure it was like baseball in America, but maybe it was like basketball in America or hockey in America. At any rate, uh, he came to America. They, 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 were, they both decided to leave Czechoslovakia. They both decided to come home to Prague from the camps. They were very, very pro-Czech, very Czech identified. And they only left Czechoslovakia after the communists took over in 1948. So they got to New York in um, late summer of 1948. And my mother was able to start working right away because there were many Czech immigrants who had come before her and many Jewish immigrants who had come before her to New York. Right. And a lot of them had enough money to buy clothes from a, from a private dressmaker. So she bought herself a sewing machine and she started working immediately. My father was unemployed for 10 years, for the first yeah. 10 years of my life. He was 44 when he came to the New York City. He didn't speak a word of English. He only spoke Czech. Um, 
it, my mother had a very, very hard time those first 10 years, because you can imagine my father was born in 1904. So he didn't really know how to help out in the house. He didn't right. know how to cook. He came from a well-off family. So he wasn't too much of a help and he was unemployed all of the time. So my mother was um, earning the living, managing the household and doing the cooking and having children. And my mother had come out of the war much more damaged than my father. Right. My mother had psychosomatic problems. She had physical problems. My father who had been an athlete had come out of the war not great, but better than my mother did. He had lost a lot of weight. I believe he weighed 95 pounds when he was liberated and he was six foot one. So, um, but he kind of came back to a, 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 no, a more normal kind of life. If I had to say who the, the designated survivor in the family was definitely my mother. She had the problems, even though my father was the one who was unemployed. And I also, have to say that I benefited from this tremendously because my father was always around to play with me. And because he was an athlete, he taught me every sport he knew. So I know how to play pretty much every sport there is. And I certainly am a good swimmer. Right, <laughs> right. And, and certainly, a, a, as you said to me before, is that he came here as this water polo expert, and there really isn't uh, an industry for water polo experts in New York. Not in New York. In, not, not, in, not in New York. Now, let's talk. I know, I know that you've been very involved lately with project um, in the Czech uh, Republic um, that you're very excited so, about. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's because I grew up speaking Czech. Um, maybe it's because my father was so, so, so much of his life was tied up with Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. He was a Lieutenant in the Czech, Czechoslovak army. And in fact, his garrison was Terezin, which mm -hmm. later became the concentration camp in which he was, he was interned. Ra round trip. Round trip, right. He had his <laughs> own round trip. But um, I, so I, after that first um, encounter with, with my place of birth in, in, during the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, I went back many times. First, I went back because I still had cousins there, distant cousins, but um, one of my cousins was Kitty, with whom my mother had survived the war. And if you read Francie's War, you'll read all yes. about Kitty. And Kitty always wanted me to come visit her, especially during the Cold War when nobody went to visit. Um, Czechoslovakia. And then afterwards, when I started writing um, where she came from, I had to go to Czechoslovakia after the Velvet Revolution to do my research. And the more research I did and the more people I met and interviewed, the more I just got attached to the culture. And um, I have to say, I had been really focusing on my mother's family. Mm -hmm. I, I was much more interested in my mother's family because they were very, very colorful and crazy and urban and, <laughs> and, and brilliant. And my father's family were these kind of backwater, um, small town Jews. And the, their biggest claim to fame was that my, my grandfather had had this leather factory and my father had been a water polo champion. And since I wasn't interested really in either, I just forgot about it until one day um, I found out that um, the re one of the regional museums in the Czech Republic was housed in my father's home. So the Epsteins had this house in Rodnice, which I had first seen in 1991. That was the first time I had gone back there. And um, I thought, well, you know, I've been focusing on my mother's life and I have, I have tons and tons of photographs. That's the other thing. This is a very, um, unusual thing in our community to have tons of photos. Yes, absolutely. The reason I have them is that they were saved on the one hand by my mother's customers who were very devoted to my mother and my grandmother. And then on my father's side, they were all saved by his water polo teammates. His best friend was the goalie for the Czechoslovak water polo team. And so there, I have like literally dozens of photographs of my father in all kinds of bathing suits. Um, competing. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I wrote cold to the director of the um, museum in Rodinsen and I said, you know, um, your museum is housed in my father's birthplace That's and my wild. grandfather and my great uncle built that house. 
And wouldn't it be a great idea to have a little exhibit about him? And much to my surprise, the director, who is an archaeologist, um, wrote back and said, this would be a great idea. Let's talk about it next time you're in Prague. So next time I went to the Czech Republic, I actually went to to, um, to Le Stolpersteine, which is yes. the thing that our community does. And um, I took my younger, my, my older son and my husband, and um, they invited us to Rodnice. And we, you know, we were traveling, we didn't dress up, we get to Rodnice, and they tell us, oh, you're going to a reception in the municipality. And they had organized this elaborate reception with the mayor and with all kinds of people, with a television crew and a banquet. And that's how this um, homecoming uh, began. And since that happened, uh, we have an exhibit planned. It was supposed to open this summer, but it's not going to because of COVID. Right. And the other thing that's happened, quite apart from this, again, I opened my email one you, day. You just never know where things are going to go. That's great. Yeah. So one day I opened my email and there is an email from Prague from a furniture maker who says, um, I'm using the floorboards from your father's house um, <laughs> to make coffee tables in the style of the First Republic of Czechoslovakia. And I, and I wrote back and I said, that sounds great, but how can you be using the floorboards from my father's house when that's the museum? Right. And he said, no, this is not the museum. This is your grandfather's factory, which, has, which, has, uh, which is a ruin right now. And it has been bought by a couple in Prague who are renovating it and plan to move into it. And they'll be in touch with you too. So <laughs> when I get to Prague after the COVID epidemic, we are going to Rodnice and we are going to see my grandfather's factory refurbished as a family, multifamily dwelling. And, and we're going to see this exhibit in <laughs> the museum, which is in my father's house. So I'm very, very tied to um, yes. developments in, Czech, in the Czech Republic. And they've been very kind to you. They've been extraordinarily yes. kind to me. I mean, they have a, they have neo Nazis just like everybody else does. Right. But in the Czech Republic, the neo Nazis are really counterbalanced by this very, very unusually history conscious and um, interested in Jews group of people. That's good to know. So, um, any idea what you'll do after that? Now, I'm just going to wait to open your next email. <laughs> That's right. Uh, no, I actually am interested in writing a cancer during COVID memoir. And um, I'm particularly interested in sharing my experience with, with people who aren't as well connected as I am and who didn't receive as extraordinary care as I did here in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So um, that's my next project. And um... Any lessons uh, that, that you can impart to them in this book about what helped you get through? Because you know, I, I, I spoke to you during it and you posted on Facebook and you were brave and optimistic. And um, you know, is there anything I, you can share? I think I really learned from my parents how to get through tough situations. I mean, first of all, I really leaned on my friends and family. Um, I found that my family was just extraordinary. I have two brothers, uh, three sisters-in-law, uh, five nephews and nieces. And, um, you know, I grew up without any of that. So uh, I, I kind of leaned on them and I really, really leaned on my friends. I asked my friends to give me film recommendations I asked everyone who could to send me food. I wanted to eat really, really well. And people send me, my sister-in-law sent me a package from Zabar's. Um, I had people baking me brownies and baking me halot. It was really, I was, and, and they also visited me because I live in the suburbs and we have a big yard. So right. people would come all the time and sit of course far apart, but it was, it was, it was not a terrible, terrible time. And I have to say that what I learned from my parents was to just stay in the moment, realize who are the people who love you and who can help you and focus on one thing at a time and just get through each day. And sometimes it was very hard, but I think it was harder for my husband than it was for me because he had to witness it. 
Right. And he, you know, everyone was championing around you to support you. And oftentimes the partner is, is the one who's feeling the pain and can't express it. And no one's there to, to, to really hold them in. Right. And I'll be writing about that too. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, let, um, let's turn to our, uh, some of the questions that have been coming in and, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, address some, any, uh, okay. Here's a question from Marilyn. Can you speak more on the effects on you by your parents' experience in the Shoah? You spoke of the trains reminding you of the cattle car. Is there anything else? Yeah, okay. I'd like to talk about something that psychologists call dissociation. Um, dissociation, uh, for those of you who aren't psychologists, can probably best be described as experiencing something in the moment as both happening but not really happening to you. So that you kind of split into two people, a person who's there experiencing it and a person who's observing it, but not really feeling it. Now, what's interesting is that my mother describes this experience in Auschwitz after her cousin Kitty tells her that people are being gassed and burned to death in Auschwitz. And she really goes through the rest of the war feeling that dissociative state. Right. And she describes herself in the book from that point on as her number, not as her name. Now, I think that what happened to me as a child was that when she told me these stories, I would dissociate. Mm -hmm. I would hear what she was saying, but I wouldn't really internalize it. I somehow was able to hear it, but not to believe it. Not and to it, take it in. Not to take it in. Yeah. And in some cases, I actually refused to take, to take it in at all. For example, her Auschwitz number, her tattoo. Yes. I could never remember that tattoo. And it's not that difficult to remember. I mean, it was A and then four numbers. And um, I could never remember it. And that... Um, that, I, that ability, that dissociative style is something that is both a very good thing and a very bad thing. It's a very good thing in emergency situations. I think it was a very good thing during my cancer um, situation. I just dissociated. I just refused to take it all in. Even when I was getting chemo, I just wouldn't look at the tubes. I looked yeah. at my electronics. I watched Hamilton while I was getting chemo. And um, so in that sense, it's a wonderful defense. I think the bad part of it is, is in intimate relationships when the person who you're in, engaging with wants you to be fully there and you're not fully there. You're partly there and part of you is not there. So that's one example of yeah. the effect of my mother's experience on me. I think, um, Something, something in my behavior that I adopted because my parents were survivors was to be a little Miss Sunshine all the time. Um, my mother was extremely depressive. Uh, she was suicidal. She uh, would often lock herself up in the bathroom and say she didn't want to live. That was very scary to me when I was a child. Any idea if she was like that? Or before the war or, or if your grandmother was like that or you think I it's know really that, just the yeah. war? I know that there is a, is a depressive streak in my mother's side of the family. My great grandmother committed mm -hmm. suicide in Vienna. She jumped out a window in Vienna. She was extremely poor and she was extremely depressed. My grandmother was also suicidal and she actually went into psychoanalysis very early in 1908 because she was so suicidal. Mm -hmm. And my mother also uh, went into therapy. On the other hand, my father was not at all suicidal, not at all depressive, but my job, it seemed to me, even as a very small child was to cheer everybody up. And that is why I have this sometimes obnoxiously cheerful, personality, um, which drives some people crazy and- um, Let it drive them crazy, it's good. <laughs> right, so those are two examples. Um, I hope that answered your question. 
Yeah, no, and, and I appreciate it because I remember speaking with you about your mother's number and you are verbal from an early age, you are observant, you see everything, you notice things, but the fact, and, and, and this was for me too, that your mother didn't hide her number, it was there and, and you couldn't see it. I, I Not mean, only that, but I also observed, you know, because my mother, my mother had lots of uh, employees and clients in addition to friends and she, she worked at home so I was the kind of you know when I came home from school there were half-dressed women in our living room <laughs> trying on clothes and so I also knew that some survivors had the number taken off cut out of their arm and I mm -hmm. remember very clearly a, a Czech survivor named Mitzi uh, who who had this had this rectangle of white flesh on her arm so it's amazing that I could remember that, but I couldn't remember the number. Yeah. yeah. Um, here's a question from Karen. Have your views about children of survivors changed over the years? Not very much. <laughs> I have to say something quite immodest. When I go back and I read the books I've written, I actually think they're really good. And <laughs> I'm um, glad you said that they are. <laughs> there, there isn't, I, I just recently did a, did a um a hundredth anniversary show for about joseph papp the man who mm -hmm. started the new york shakespeare festival and i had forgotten so much because i wrote the book in 1990 and so i had to go back and read it and i thought wow this is really interesting this is good reading and that's how i feel when i read children of the holocaust i feel that um my views about what i wrote there really haven't changed very much um if i had to write it again today mm -hmm. The only thing I would probably change is I, you know, I had chosen very carefully chosen people to profile in that book. Right, from so Canada. That, so that there's reportage and there's my story and then there are lots of other people's stories. And so I would certainly take care to include a gay child of survivors. And I think I would also include a second generation child of non-Jews who was in the camps because since writing that book, I have gotten so much um, mail, both snail and email, from non-Jews who, uh, whose parents were in the Second World War in some capacity. Either they were Ameri children of American POWs or children of Dutch POWs or children of resistance fighters or children of non-Jews who were interned in the camps. Mm -hmm. And all of those people um, have very similar issues to ours. Right. But but when you were, you know, when you were writing it and, and the first book, you were, what, 28 years old yes. um, and, and you knew all this, you saw it. Um, but in the 40 plus years since then, and you've had life experiences and, and, and maturity, looking back at your parents and, and other survivors, do you see things differently? Can you understand more um, what your childhood was like and why? I suppose so. I suppose that um, writing The Long Half-Lives of Love and Trauma really helped me understand my mother much better. I mean, you know, there hasn't been a whole lot written about what happened to women and their sense of self during the war. Yeah. And because my mother was in the fashion industry and I was not interested in fashion, I never gave much thought to um, what had happened to her sense of herself as a woman. And in reading her book, I realized that um, that sense of self was really destroyed. I mean, she didn't think she was attractive. She certainly didn't think she was beautiful. Right. Um, she wound up having an affair um, when I was a small child with, um, with a non-Jewish non man who was actually my, my nanny's husband. And one of the reasons she gave for it was she, her sense of self as a Jewish woman had been so damaged that the idea that this non-Jew thought she was beautiful and thought she was mm -hmm. sexy and thought she was lovable was so important to her, far more important than my father thinking that she was beautiful. I mean, my father was 16 years older than she was. And, you know, he, he, he thought that he had won the lottery when, when they got oh. married. Um, so... All of that 
um, I can understand much better now. But in terms, uh, I kind of got the whole thing when I was 28. I just got it. And what I, did. what I didn't get myself, I got from other people because I interviewed so many people and I heard so many stories that um, I really got it. You know, some of the most amazing stories are from people who didn't know they were Jewish until they were 30 or 40 or 50 years old. Right. And that was astonishing to me because, you know, for me, I always, you know, you can't be named Epstein and not know you're Jewish, especially in New York City. And right. so I suppose that was, um, but I understood that too, because I met those people back then. I, would, I was just very, very lucky to be in the right place at the right time. And I met this incredible variety of people from people around, from all around the world. Okay, here's a question from Stephen. Would you suggest other children of survivors put their family collect, collections in writing? What else can children of survivors do to preserve the memory of the Holocaust? Well, I definitely think that Finding documents in your family of any kind is really important. Look for letters, look for diaries, look for photographs, look for certificates. There's all kinds of stuff around. And you, you never finish with this stuff. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I thought I had done all the research I could possibly do. And then last week when I did this reading of um, names from Terezin that was organized by the Terezin Initiative, I started looking at the dates of when my, my grandparents and when my uncles and when my cousin went to Terezin. And I realized just looking at the dates when they were deported from Terezin to Auschwitz or from Terezin to other points east, that my father had been able to protect his parents because he was a quartermaster in Terezin as he had been in the Czechoslovak army, but right. he hadn't been able to protect his brother, either of his brothers and, mm -hmm. or his nephew. And for the first time now, you know, we're talking about somebody who's been doing this research for 50 years. For the first time I realized, oh, there's all this stuff that my father never talked about. And the only way I can reconstruct it is through these documents. And you know, through these archival things, which just tell you dates and places. So even if you have absolutely nothing, or you think you have absolutely nothing, you can go to the archives. The Yad Vashem archives are incredible at this point because so many people have put in witness statements about other survivors. And there's so much online. You can, you can sit home in, in the comfort of your own home and I, I found both tick. I, I found incredible documents, and I'm, um, I'm assuming everybody else can as well. It's right. And then once you have the documents, and once you have a sense of the story, then you tell your story, and you tell your story to um, people who you get into conversations with about life. You know, I I live um, in a neighborhood which is in a suburban neighborhood which is extremely heterogeneous. I have. African American neighbors, I have Asian American neighbors, I have a Venezuelan neighbor right across the street from me right now. And when I get into conversations with them, I tell them what my history is. You know, I have a sign in my yard that says Black Lives Matter and another sign that says Asian Lives Matter. And people notice and they ask me about it and they say, well, why, why, why are you doing this? And I say, well, you you know, they're black kids in the neighborhood. I want them to know I'm on their side. And here's why I want them to know why I'm on their side. Because and the why is because of what happened in, during right. the Holocaust. Right. It's like the Haggadah. Like the Haggadah. Right. So in essence, you, you, you're orally telling your, your story and explaining it to, it, to people to right. Right. Understand. And, you know, many of us have opportunities professionally where we can um, add this to the conversation. I'm not saying, you know, I go around with a sign saying I am a child of Holocaust survivors, but, <laughs> when, it, but when it comes up, I do talk about it. It's a, a teaching moment. Um, here's a question from Amy. Many survivors married other survivors. Did that help or hurt them in raising children together? <laughs> that is beyond my pay scale. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a question you should ask Eva Fogelman. Um, 
who has done a lot more work than I have on Absolutely. This. But um, they're just different. I mean, my, hu my husband is a child of survivors. His parents were Romanian survivors. Um, would they have been better parents if each of them had married somebody who wasn't a survivor? I, hard to say. Um, I cannot imagine my parents not marrying survivors after what they had been through. So it's kind of an academic question for me. I do know and have interviewed people who's where one 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 person was a, a mixed marriage. One mixed marriage, one parent <laughs> was a survivor and one parent was not. Um, they have different kinds of problems, but they have problems too, and certainly issues. Right. And your husband's family were survivors as well. Did Was his knowledge as extensive as yours about his family no. story? My husband knows absolutely not one thing about what happened to his family before the war, except that his parents got married in Bucharest in during the war sometime. We're not even sure what the date is. Right. And they were in a hotel. They had breakfast. They went out for a walk. And when they came back, the hotel was gone. It had been bombed. That's the only story we know about the war. We know kind of from other people that his mother and her family were hidden in a village where they paid everybody off. And we know that his father had been in a work camp, but that's it. So that's the epitome of what you said, that everybody came out differently and everybody handles and processes differently. And certainly you and your husband's family are, are dramatically different. Well, I'm looking at the time now and um, it's a wonderful conversation and boy, did it go fast. So I would like to thank everyone from all over the country and the world and, and, and for, for joining us tonight. And certainly for Helen, for your time and for speaking so honestly and openly about, about your, your story, your history and your family. And thank you to the museum for um, offering this program and all the other excellent programs that, that you offer during the year, all, all about different topics. And thank you, Ari, and um, I'll turn it back over to Ari. And thank you all for coming. Thank you both so much, Helen and Ellen, that was meaningful. Christine, and I was just thinking while you were speaking, there were, um, uh, in, in 2009, statistics said that there were 55,000 Holocaust survivors in the New York area. So I, I would guess originally there were a couple hundred thousand Holocaust survivors. So there must be a million plus children. I mean, this is on the spot math. There are a lot of children of survivors in New York and around the country. So the, the community of people um, that, that you're talking about in these experiences is so large and the lessons in the experiences of kids as survivors are in, in some ways universal to a lot of different communities of people that have experienced. In some ways they're really particular, but there's also something universal. So it's just, uh, it's a privilege to learn from you and to reflect on what you're saying. Thank you. I, I want to thank uh, you, Ellen and Eva Fogelman and the Descendants of Holocaust yes. for being such a great partner of the museum. Uh, and mention that we have another joint program in June with Menachem Rosensaft, which we put a link to in the chat. Um, and a very special thank you to our partners at the Battery Park City Authority, who so generously sponsor our program, programming at the museum. Uh, this evening's program is sponsored in part through the Battery Park City Authority Community Partnership. And we have two upcoming programs that I put in the chat that are also a part of that community partnership with Battery Park City. So, and lastly, I of course should mention that we are very grateful for those of you who support the museum by making a donation or, or being members. Uh, there's a link to the membership in the chat. If you're interested in joining our community, it's a great way to support our work and we are grateful for it. So thank you again, Helen. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you all for being here and uh, we wish everyone a good evening. Good night. Thank you.